before going into the actual poem, we need to have an understanding of the word half caste. And I'm going to explain it, just basically assuming that you might not have heard that term used before. It is used as a, historically, as a sort of derogatory term for mixed race people. And the reason it's derogatory is because of that concept of being half. So the word caste is referring to essentially the social uh, hierarchy of races that exists, right? Where your basic order is you got your white people down the top, up, and your black people right at the bottom of it. But the point is that by being mixed race, you are half of something. You are half of an inferior race that is tainting the purity of the white blood within you. That's the basic idea behind it, is that the existence of a mixed race person is a sign that a higher, uh, better race has been made impure or corrupted by the existence of being mixed with a non-white race. And that is why it is so derogatory, because it holds within it this suggestion that by nature of being mixed race, you are impure in some way, and that only half of you is worthy of respect, privilege, all the various things that racists believe. Now, you won't necessarily have to show that historical historical context when you're writing about this poem, but I think it is really important for you to understand before you go into reading it, because the entire sort of premise that you are half of a person and only half of you is worthy and significant, that premise is what Agard is essentially spending this poem attacking. He's very much speaking to a personal experience here of having been called that word and trying to really sort of attack the use of that word. From the very beginning of the poem, it's clear that Agard is not taking this use of the word half caste seriously um, and is mocking it. And the reason we get that mocking tone in the opening stanza is from that uh, absurd image that we've got of standing on one leg. Um, you know, the idea of someone having to have a conversation standing on one leg because they're only half of something. It's immediately mocking that idea of being half of something from the very beginning. And it seems to be, if you look at that, um, excuse me, it seems to be quite sort of polite and, and apologetic. But of course, with the ridiculousness of the image, it, we just realise that sort of part of the mocking there as well. In fact, this isn't about being polite and apologetic whatsoever. In reality, this poem is all about being very confident and proud of who you are. And we see that, first of all, with the fact that we're going to have this imperative of explain yourself repeated many, many times throughout the poem. By using that imperative and demanding the person they're speaking to explain why they're using the word half cast, it's quite confrontational and shows that they want them to really break down. This entire po poem is about forcing someone to confront their use of a word and what they mean by that word. Now, yes, you could argue that um, Agard is speaking to racists here and, and trying to attack racist logic, and he certainly does attack racist logic. However, I don't think he's just speaking to racist people. I think he's also speaking to just the racially ignorant, those using words without truly thinking about what it is that they're saying. And so he's essentially trying to get the person that he's speaking to, he's trying to get them to do that. He's trying to get them to actually think about what they're saying and what they really mean by that. And that's what this entire stanza is doing. So the first example is when he makes this analogy with when Picasso mixes red and green, you get a half cast cam uh, canvas. Now, the reason he keeps making these analogies and analogies is just, you know, when you're comparing something to something else. The reason he keeps making these points of comparison is a means of pointing out the logical flaws by being like, look, it's similar in that, you know, you're mixing two things and yet we view it very differently here compared to when we view it with human beings. So like in the case of this analogy, which is talking about art, we understand that mixing colors makes something beautiful, unique, diverse, and that's only a good thing in the world of art, is the mixing of various different colors in various different ways. And yet, when it comes to human beings, we see it as a sign of you know, inferiority, not being good enough, and so on and so forth. 
And he continues that as well. If I jump down a bit um, to where we have the Tchaikovsky example as well, it's the same kind of pattern. This time, of course, with music and the reference to the black key and the white key. That analogy is essentially the same as the Picasso one, but just taking a different um, sphere of the world, this time music. And again, symphonies have connotations of being incredibly beautiful, complex, masterful pieces of art. And then when we apply the word half cast in front of it, when we, we can talk about this being a pre-modifying adjective, which just means that the adjective comes before the noun rather than after it. So like a black cat rather than the cat is black. When we have it pre-modifying the symphony because of those pejorative connotations of half cast of inferiority, it takes something away from the symphony, from the canvas that it wouldn't normally otherwise. And so it's almost like what Agard is trying to make these people realize is what is taken away from a human being when you apply that term half cast to them. You know, because the idea of a half cast canvas and a half cast symphony are obviously ridiculous. That's the whole point of the analogy. It's obviously ridiculous. Symphonies are beautiful when they're mixing the different notes with the black and white keys. Um, and canvases are obviously beautiful when they're mixing colors to create their piece of art. Anyone suggesting otherwise is, you know, foolish. And so he's trying to say the same is true for human beings. No human being is half of something just because it's a mix of two things. When we come to the example, the analogy that he makes in the middle of the when light and shadow mix in the sky, that is just another example because I think that imagery again of light and shadow is really beautiful and so calling it half cast weather feels like you're sort of not appreciating the complexity of what is actually going on in the sky between those two things. However, this is also be the beginning of a deeper comment that he makes about the existence of racism in England. So he says that in that case, England weather nearly always half cast. That is of course part of more of the uh, joking and mocking of the fact that in England, yes, it is overcast the majority of the time. That is the sort of default status of our weather. Um, however, he turns it into a metaphor about racism in this next section where he says, in fact, some of those clouds half cast till they're overcast, so spiteful they don't want the cloud, uh, they don't want the sun to pass. So the clouds are the metaphor for the racist people and they are in fact making things so overcast and gloomy and they don't want that sun which represents like happiness and joy to come back. So it's speaking to this idea, we, this sort of awful consequence of racism that you essentially in the name of trying to be, as he says, spiteful, in the name of trying to maintain your hate, you make the world a worse place. You stop that sun from shining, you stop that happiness, that joy. You just make things worse. And all of that metaphor is important in showing not just the fact that he's mocking the uh, flaws of the racist ideology, which again, this is a sort of pointing out the flaws of racism because it's pointing out a harm of racism. But this next bit where he says our ass is also really significant in that um, that is Caribbean slang. And it's essentially a word that means like, it's used to express like your frustration, your anger with somebody. Um, so it's like an interjection that you would make to show your frustration. And so he's showing his frustration, essentially, at this point in the poem. So at this point, you know, he's given two examples and he's talked about the racism that exists and how it stops things for people. And he is getting sort of, he's frustrated and angry as well. So although there is a mocking tone in this poem, it isn't funny. It isn't about being a joke. It is about a sort of frustrated, angry, like, look at how ridiculous you are. Look at how ridiculous this word is. And, and a frustration with why people are using this word and why people are being racist, essentially, and a frustration with that behavior. 
the use of the Caribbean slang is also important in a sort of third aspect to the tone of this poem and that is a sense of uh, pride in identity. There is obviously no question because of the mocking tone that John Agar does not actually view himself as being half of a person and being inferior and unworthy. And another way that he shows that pride is yes with the Caribbean slang but also with the phonetic spelling throughout the poem. That just means that you spell how you say something and so phonetic spelling is usually used to create accents. In this case it's being used to create a Caribbean accent. And so he is taking great ownership and pride over who he is and how he speaks in this poem. He's not sort of adapting it to meet any kind of Western expectation of how he should speak. It also of course keeps in the forefront of our minds the half of himself that the racists so um, dismiss and ignore. He is almost forcing them to acknowledge the Caribbean side of him by using this really strong uh, Caribbean voice throughout the poem. As a side note, a really unfortunate consequence is that there's been decades of teachers across Britain trying to put on horrific Caribbean accents to read this poem. But there you go. Everything gonna be iry. When we then come to the next stanza, that's still the same sort of formula we've already seen. This is a very straightforward poem of just like, the term half cast is stupid, let me keep giving you example after example after example of why. And that sort of like repetition, not just of the explain yourself, but also of the different analogies as well, is just serving to sort of, it creates a sort of mounting effect of just how ridiculous this all is. Like here's another way, here's another way, here's another way of looking at it. And the constant comparisons making us see that there is no logical reasoning whatsoever to thinking this way and thinking that someone is half of anything. When it comes to this stanza though, he brings the poem back to being a bit more personal to himself. So up here it was more making these analogies, comparing the concept to other concepts, art, music, nature. Down here it's about forcing them to confront the individual, the person. And I think that's really important as well because the confronting of the individual is something that perhaps somebody who uses the word half cast does not have to do very often. Still though, it's absolutely mocking again because we're told he's listening with the half of his ear and the half of his eye. Um, he introduces himself with a half of his hand. So it's more of that, just like with the standing one leg in the first stanza, it's more of that like absurdist imagery that makes it feel comical and silly and thus makes the actual use of the word half cast seem silly because it just doesn't make any sense. I think the reference to being offered half a hand is an interesting one there uh, when you're introducing yourself to someone because yes, on the one hand, it is just a continuation of the ridiculous image of the eye and the ear, but I think it also speaks to one of the problems, another problem that racism creates and that is the fact that you cannot truly get to know someone when you view them as being half of a person. That sort of offering of a hand is symbolic of a potential relationship there. So the fact that it's only half of a hand is symbolic of the fact that as long as you are using the term half cast and as long as you are believing in that term and believing that you know only half of the person is worthy of any attention you are never going to be able to build a true relationship and truly get to know that person because you're only paying attention to half of them he also then talks about the fact that when he sleeps at night sleeps at night he dreams half a dream now of course this could be just another like sort of continuation, half this, half that, and all the different ways is half. But again, I think similar to the hand, the dream has some symbolicness to it as well. If we think about dreams, they typically symbolize like, you know, what you hope to achieve in life and your hopes for the future. The fact that he dreams half a dream could perhaps be speaking to the sort of uh, limited opportunities that racism causes for all people of color, but included within that mixed race people too. And I think that fits with the fact that just before it, he's used this adverb consequently. So it's like, because of the fact that he's only half a person, half the eye, half the ear, half the hand, it then affects his dreams, creates a, a causational link between the way he's viewed by others 
physically as a person affecting the more intangible abilities like you know opportunities achievements hopes dreams etc it has an impact on those things as well we've then got this line about how when the moon begins to glow i half cast human being cast half a shadow it's a nice uh, inversion of the half cast cast half there the use of the human being i think is similar to what I was saying before about the half cast symphony. There's something quite jarring, there's a jarring effect between that adjective and then the noun of a human being. That idea of being referred to as half, he's simultaneously reminding us of his humanity via the noun human being, but also how his humanity is taken by others with the use of the adjective half caste. And so that jarring effect is all about making us see how we are simultaneously equal and unequal. I can't of course call it an oxymoron because those phrases aren't really opposites, but that is the similar effect that it creates like those two things shouldn't be together you can't be half of a human being in any kind of way what we then have though is this like essentially like a little volta here where the tension is turned and the reason i say volta is because i think there is a change of tone here where the mocking is dropped and instead it focuses much more on the serious tone as it goes back to speaking much more about the person that the poem is for rather than the half caste, the mixed race person. As they're told to come back tomorrow with the whole of their eye, the whole of their ear and the whole of their mind. Now, I'm gonna come back to the tomorrow line in a second. I wanna go to the eye, ear, mind first. And I think what Agard is pointing out by this point is the irony that actually they are the ones, the, the racists and the racially ignorant that are using this term half caste, they are the ones that are missing something here. And so that's why he's having to tell them to come back with the whole of the eye, the whole of the ear, the whole of the mind. Where yes, the eye and the ear symbolize what they can see and what they can hear, but the mind is also symbolic of their like perspective. Um, and their essentially their ideology, their beliefs, their values, and he's telling them to come back with more open-mindedness, more tolerance, more um, belief in racial equality, more appreciation for the words they're using, what those mean, all of those things. He wants them to come back basically with a new way of looking at this word half caste and race and, and people. That's the important thing is you need to come back and look at people differently. And in return, he'll tell you the other half of his story. So it's like the other half of my story, if you think of stories having those connotations of something incredibly rich and complex and it represents his entire life experience, it's this idea that if they can change their perspective, they will be able to actually get to know him um, and, and truly see him for the person that he is. So when we then think about the fact that they're told to come back tomorrow, tomorrow could be representative of like the future of the social change and the social progress that can happen in society when we actually learn from, we go through this education, we learn our mistake, learn from our mistakes and change the way we speak, the way we behave, the way we treat others. And so he's, really ending on a sort of hopeful tone of change um, and that people can learn when they have sort of had it pointed out to them this idea of how ridiculous it is this use of this word half cast and going back as well to that sense of like pride in his story as well i think that's why this is it's a stanza on its own and why we have this stanza break at this point it's separated out from the stanzas where it was like mocking the concept of being half cast because he is not half of anything and it's this whole sort of little chunk at the end and i think that in terms of this privileged position of this being the final stanza and the final line uh, of the poem being like my story notice the half hasn't made it into the final line is just my story there's a feeling of like completeness of wholeness um in this stanza that of course has been denied to him by virtue of being viewed as a half cast or half of something so when we look at this poem overall again it's not an especially complicated poem it's um fairly obvious but it's designed to be because of course part of agard's point is that it should be really obvious 
why the use of the word half cast is ridiculous um, and makes no sense and the harm that it causes. So in terms of the central themes of this poem, yes, you've obviously got the concept of racism and him sort of attacking the flaws of that ideology, but you've also got the power of words, the power and importance of words and the importance of thinking about what we're saying and thinking about what that means and how we're treating others as a result. And then the final thing I would just add is it's looking at that sort of theme of identity. Yes, how our identities can be challenged in the form of things like racism, but also how we can still have a pride in our identity, as he has a, clearly a pride in his Caribbean heritage and who he is as a Caribbean person. Before I forget, actually, there's one more element that we can perhaps say as part of that Pride in the Caribbean heritage. So you might have noticed that this poem, aside from the question marks, uh, it doesn't really have any punctuation and it uses a huge amount of enjambment. Now, we could say that that's part of creating the sort of conversational tone to the poem, making it feel like Agard is essentially, you know, speaking to somebody and it's definitely part of that. I would also say though there is perhaps something similar to what he does in another of his poems, Checking Out Me History, and that is the fact that traditionally in Caribbean culture it's very much an oral tradition, so poetry and things are very much focused on being said out loud, and that's why you could say he's chosen to give this a conversational tone, why he's chosen to make it feel like it really is being said. And so it is also part of embracing that Caribbean oral tradition um, as well of, you know, spoken poetry um, and not feeling like he has to present himself in a particular Western traditional way. I can remember being a teenager when I first studied um, the poem Half Cast and at that point in my life I had been called that word multiple times and, and hated it every time. And I really loved this poem even though I thought it was ridiculously easy as far as poems go. I loved it for just how much it outright mocked the racist ideology um, and simultaneously celebrated being mixed race. We are symphonies, we are canvases, um, we are wonderful, beautiful things. And so I think this poem isn't just speaking to the racist and the, the racially ignorant, it is also a celebration of being mixed race as suggested with those connotations of beauty and diversity and uniqueness that come across in those analogies from Picasso and Tchaikovsky too. Make sure you hit subscribe and have a look at my videos on whatever other English stuff that you need and comment below if there's any video content in particular that you want to see. See you later.